good to see our friend from Yahoo Sports. Good to see you, Dan. How are you, sir? I'm well, Rich. How are you? I'm well. Giants, Giants loss otherwise. I know. I'm good. Are, you, are you a G-Man fan? I didn't know that. No, 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 I'm not a fan. Okay, very good. I felt for you. I okay, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just. I, I have no. Uh, I have no skin in that game at all. But let's let's oh, okay. let's jump in here. Um, what can you tell us about Matthew Sluka and his decision? And then we can sort of get into what you think it means writ large for the sport, Dan. Yeah, uh, Matthew Sluka is a, a kid who transferred to UNLV after four years at Holy Cross uh, FCS program and uh, won the starting job this summer, became the starter at UNLV. They're 3-0. and uh, They're doing really well. They're ranked for the first time in a long time. Uh, big game against Fresno this week, but on Tuesday night announced he was going to redshirt, preserve his final year of eligibility, and transfer after the season. And there's a lot of back and forth, but essentially he and his family um, and their agent uh, believe they were going to get about $100,000 or $100,000 if they were going to play at UNLV. UNLV said that's not the case. Uh, they only received about three thousand uh, dollars from a from the UNLV collective, uh, which is basically like a booster group that gets together to pay quote unquote NIL money. And there's a dispute of whether they they deserve it or not. There was nothing put in writing, uh, and UNLV saying as a as a program that you know they can't pay them. The collective said um, this uh, this was never agreed to in writing, and we were never really going to give you a hundred thousand dollars. There's a lot of confusion. But Matthew Sluka has transferred from UNLV and caused a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, eyebrow raising around college football. I'd put it. So um, you know, I, I can't imagine those in charge of college football, whoever the hell they are, wherever they sit, um, that they 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 can't want a kid saying, "I was promised this money by somebody, and I'm now going to redshirt to leave." And then uh, local concerns like uh, a casino reaches out to the school saying, we'll pay the $100,000. <laughs> and the school admits that we did get that phone call, but uh, we did not accept that offer from gambling concerns. I mean, this is an absolute holy hell of a mess, Dan. And the question is, is how does it get fixed? How does it get fixed? Yeah, uh, it's certainly not... <laughs> Not the way they would love the public attention on this. Uh, look, I'm of the belief this really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, we've had NIL for about three or four years. We've had two cases of publicly players saying, I was promised all this money, I didn't get it. The other was uh, quarterback Jaden Rashada, who thought he was going to get $13 million to play at the University of Florida and uh, with a collective and actually had a contract, but that collective dissolved and he didn't get it. He then went to Arizona State. Now he's at Georgia. He's a backup at Georgia. Um, and now we have the Sluka case. Now, there are other cases where people didn't get what they thought they should get or, or promised. Uh, there's always a lot of confusion with these things. You know, collectors will say things like, look, you're going to get a hundred thousand dollar car and a player will instead of getting a car, he doesn't get ownership of the car, he gets to drive the car. And then he has to give it back. And so there's different things like that that come along. But one thing we know about college football and college sports in general, Rich, is they've been paying players. Boosters have been playing players for generations. And in the past, Matthew Saluka would have had no way out. Uh, if Once he took the three grand, um, you could be promised 100 and boosters would do it. Coaches would do it all the time. They'd give him three grand and then you were blackmailed and stuck because if you admitted you took the three grand, the NCA would end your eligibility. So this has been going on a long time. I think it's going on less now. Uh, we just have some public cases of it where, where you have it going. I don't see this. I see two cases over multiple years and I don't see a big concern. I think there is a lot of people in college athletics um, who either want to declare everything a disaster or in the media make a lot of ratings and money off of declaring everything a disaster. And I actually think two cases kind of prove the system's working pretty good. No kidding, Dan, because I'll, I'll, I'll offer a little pushback here. There's got to be multiple cases around the country of kids we don't know who left a school, who left a program, who went somewhere, was promised something, and their lives are completely upended. 
uh, they or they or, or they had no idea that they were owed they owed taxes on this stuff, and now they're in debt. Or they want, well, I, and, I, and I understand it's it's caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, and what have you. I I understand that, but the fact that there's uh, few rules, hardly any um, uh, enforcement that it appears can only seem to create an issue if a coach leaves and 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 he goes somewhere else there's a an actual contract that's in a central office that that a judge can actually you know uphold there's arbitration there's all that stuff with these kids there's there's a transfer portal window and and good luck and and now a team in the middle of a season needs to switch quarterbacks uh, i i I, I consider well, that a, Luca, a problem. Luca should have signed a contract. That, that was his problem. He didn't sign a contract. So you can sign a contract with the collective, and then he would have the ability to go to civil litigation and 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 remedy the situation. He didn't. Uh, a, a guy in Vegas promises you a hundred grand. Uh, you know that's a heck of a you know. Good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Um, <laughs> the house always wins. So uh, good luck. But he had he should have signed a contract. I mean, they did. They did. A, they did a poor job. That is, uh, yeah. Buyer beware. Got kids not knowing you pay taxes on earnings. Uh, there, there's 15, 16 year olds in this country working fast food. They they know you have to pay taxes. First time you get a check. Um, there, it, it's you know, this is unfortunate that it happened. It's not great for you on LV. You would absolutely be better off if they if the college athletics wants to recognize the players as employees have them form uh with some kind of union or group and then collectively bargain with them and have contracts and things like that that could protect some of the stuff but at the same time this is what's going to happen the ncaa has a very pro player rule uh where you're allowed to play four games and then determine you want to red shirt and preserve your year eligibility. And they did this because there were a lot of unfair and unfortunate cases where say a kid was going to, you know, you only have four years to play and you were going to red shirt your season. And then at the end of the year, a team had a bunch of injuries and you had to get in there for like a game and a half and you blew your, your entire season because of something that really wasn't planned or really no, it was out of everyone's control. So they created this rule where it's like, Hey, you have a four game window. Now that can be exploited. OK, if if a player, I'm not going to say a hypothetical player comes out and starts as quarterback at UNLV and starts with this great season and says, hey, I'm getting 100 grand here, but I'm now got enough tape that I could redshirt, save my last year and go to the power five for, say, a million dollars next year. They can do that. That red that loophole is out there. But if you want to close that loophole, what are you going to do? Force a kid to play? Or are you going to say? Uh, world determine whether you're allowed to redshirt or you're allowed to transfer I mean, with mental health. It's just, it's not going to work. So it's the uniqueness of college athletics and the limited time frame that this, this window is open and, and trying to close it would cause other, other issues. We have not seen a million of these things happen. You would also have other schools say, am I going to pay a million dollars for a kid to just quit on his team? So there's sort of market forces that would correct it. But uh, yeah, this is an ideal. You're, you've outsourced labor. You've outsourced labor to a collective. But college sports has always outsourced labor to a collective and to boosters. It's just now there's more openness to it and more remedy to it, and we're not seeing a million cases. Does it happen? Sure. Uh, is, this a, is this a great situation? No. But if the Slukas had signed a contract with the UNLV collective, then everyone could sit there and say, hey, you actually owe them the money. Pay them. They didn't. They took a potentially verbal agreement that I think people at UNLV would say, we never made that deal. And this is where you have the mess. That's Dan Wetzel of uh, Yahoo Sports National Sports Columnist here on the Rich Eisen Show. Where where are we headed towards an actual um, central office here that's not the NCAA? I, I know there's that working group between the SEC and Big Ten commissioners um, there's a Supreme Court case being handed down. Where where are we on on heading towards actually getting closer to what you referred to contracts, employees, unions, um, some sort of uniformity amongst the maybe the Big Five? I, I don't know. Where where are we on that? Do you think, Dan? Well, there's there's various uh, cases here. Uh, the 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 
college sports, there, one of your things you said, the people who are in charge, no one's in charge. That's kind of the problem. There is no Roger Goodell you can turn to. It's why we have conference realignment, right? The NFC East can't just say, hey, Steelers, join us. <laughs> you know, like this is what we have in college sports. It's supposed to be may. It's supposed to be mayhem. Uh, but the people that run college sports are bureaucrats. They love rules. They love rules. They love meetings about rules. They love rules about meetings. They love rules. So they're always going to try to create a bureaucracy and regulations that can try to solve every problem. Uh, and they and they won't until they allow them to be employees, which they are adamantly opposed to and are lobbying like heck in Congress to try to avoid. Um, but even we will have direct payment potentially within a year of schools saying we will directly pay you. So someone like Sluka would be getting a salary or some kind of stipend directly from UNLV, but that ca they cannot stop the collectives from offering additional money until they collectively bargain with the players. Uh, and even then, it might be tough. The Sherman Antitrust Act is, is a real problem for the NCA. It's not new, but they're in violation of it with almost every rule they come up with. And the last time they went to the Supreme Court, they lost nine to zero. And uh, Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, wrote a, a concurring opinion that said, don't come back, basically. You're going to lose. You're going to get crushed here. <laughs> so they are stuck trying to uh, twist themselves into some deal where they're not employees, but they're not in violation of this rule. But we're not restraining trade and all these different things. And, and I don't really see how it works, but they are trying to come up with some kind of system. I just don't I don't know how it would possibly be legal. So. Um, you see state attorneys generals coming up with rules saying you can't you can't enforce this. Uh, the NCAA college sports is blocked in. So I get look, the, the, the popular opinion here, the, the easiest thing for me to do is pound the table. This is the biggest disaster ever. Everything's horrible. Fix it It isn't an easy fix. And again, two cases. One kid says I had a verbal deal to get 100 grand. Why didn't you sign a contract? This is not uh, Armageddon or, or some cataclysmic event for college athletics. Dan Wetzel here on the Rich Eisen Show. So before I go, I guess let's go into the toy department and I talk about an actual game. How do you see Alabama and Georgia playing out, Dan? Fascinating game. Fascinating game. Obviously, big game for Kalen DeBoer at, at Alabama. Uh, first big, first SEC game, first truly big game for him trying to replace Nick Saban. Obviously, you can lose this game. He's going to be fine. You could lose this game, still win the SEC, still win the SEC, the national championship. However, Kalen DeBoer has been brought in, and he does things different than Nick Saban. He's an offensive coach, not a defense coach. He has a different kind of style to do things. Um, and he is trying to use his winning ways. He's been an unbelievably successful coach with the power of Alabama, he's trying to be sort of the post Saban success story. What's interesting about this game is they're going against Kirby smart, who is essentially Saban 2.0 and Georgia was built in almost the mirror image of Saban's Alabama program, same system, same competitiveness, same recruiting philosophy, all of that. So it's a, it's an interesting bit to watch uh, kind of Nick Saban's impact. His name's not just on the field and he's not just on game day and up in the box, but his impact on this game, one guy trying to succeed him, one guy trying to imitate him. Um, really, really interesting game. If I'm picking a team, uh, Alabama's at home and getting one and a half points. They're never, they haven't been home dogs since 2007. Um, I'd probably lean that way, but I, I expect a really heck of a game. All right. And uh, what, what's your two cents as well about the season so far? Uh, I th do you think Texas is a worthy number one? What's your what's your opinion on the way everything on the field has played out, Dan? Texas Storyline. looks great. I was at the Michigan game. They played Michigan, uh, obviously saw it. And, uh, and they looked, you know, you watch the game um, and you just see they got playmakers all over the field. Uh, both lines are tremendous quarterback depth. I mean, they got Quinn Ewers out. And Arch Manning steps in. Uh, they're going to Mississippi State, I'm almost certain, this weekend. Yep. And uh, we'll see if they can, uh, you know, how Ar if Arch plays. I, I don't know if they made that announcement yet today, um, but I think he's expected to, how he'll handle that. But they have such depth all over the place. And they're, they're one spot, they're weak running back. They found some other guys that can run the ball. So they're so good in the line. They remind me a little of the Michigan team last year when you just watch them. And a lot of times when you watch college football, you look and you go out, oh, there's the weakness or that kid's not that good. Or, you know, they're trying to hide this. 
they don't look to be a single weakness in this Longhorn team. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. It did remind me of the Michigan National Championship team with a you know quarterback that's got you know NFL upside uh, program coming off of a, a difficult to handle loss in the college football semifinal the year before. Um, a, a, a head coach with uh, pro experience, the whole thing. I mean, soup to nuts. They they do they do ha- have echoes of all of that. Dan, I I appreciate your time and and your your always uh, interesting two cents. Thank you. Appreciate it, Rich. You Talk got, to you soon. You got it. Yahoo National Sports columnist Dan Wetzel. Check out the College Football Inquirer pod that he hosts as well. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.